Hi, welcome back to OCR Biology on DNA. Um, last time we ran out briefly of time, I took about DNA and how it was packaged. So we're going to briefly consider that. Then we're going to talk about DNA replication. Let's go back to our DNA packaging. And thinking about, first of all, eukaryotic cells. Remember that eukaryotes are anything that has a true nucleus, known as a membrane-bound nucleus. Um, and within eukaryotic cells, the DNA is packaged as a chromosome. Here is a picture of a chromosome, this sort of classic cross shape. Uh, now, there's about two metres of DNA in one cell. Imagine the cell is microscopic, but you've still got to, to get two metres worth of stuff in, two metres being taller than a person or most people. Uh, you need to fit it into the tight uh, space by coiling it up. How does it do that? It does it around some proteins. This protein is called histones. Now, histone with DNA wrapped around it, there's something called chromatin, the substance from which chromosomes are made from. Chromo means coloured, so chromosomes are literally coloured bodies, and they, they were the things you could actually see in a nucleus, which you can see when a cell is dividing, and only when a cell is dividing. Otherwise, you can't see chromosomes clearly. In prokaryotes, uh, DNA is found in the loose in the cytoplasm. They don't have histosomes, they don't have chromosomes, um, they don't have a membrane-bound nucleus, so therefore it's free to move uh, in the cytoplasm. This diagram helps to explain this, uh, the sort of packaging up a bit more clearly. You've got DNA here. It's then wound around these sort of histone proteins uh, to form something called a nucleosome. And then these can stack on top of one another and fold and coil and fold and coil and what we call condense until you get a chromosome. So it's kind of a really neat packaging solution as to how you can wind up something that is uh, very long to get it to fit into a microscopic space. The main body of this presentation I want to talk about is going to be um, DNA replication. We obviously need to have a review of understanding our structure of DNA. Let's think about that as we go through. Uh, I'm going to skip to uh, the idea that we understand, which is DNA is a double helix. Remember Watson and Crick, they said that the uh, complementary base pairs, in other words, they're matching A with T and G with C, is a key to DNA ability to replicate. Because it's the hydrogen bonds, we mentioned these last time, that are easily broken. Now, they need to be easily broken because you need to actually detach the bonds so that you can do some replicating. And as part of the cell cycle, the process of... Um, producing new cells, one uh, cell from another, making exact copies, you need to be able to replicate DNA first. And um, the DNA sort of acts as its own template. Now, there have been different models talked about. There's conservative and semi-conservative replication, uh, and one called dispersive as well. Um, some have more scientific evidence than others as to which is the correct ones. Let's consider them. Obviously, this is a model of a, our analog model of a, a DNA strand. So uh, it helps to have this in colour. Um, conservative, um, the original parental strand is conserved or kept. So, in other words, the whole of the original strand is kept like that, and you get a new strand forming in some way, shape, or form without a proposed model as to how that's going to be done. In semi conservative, you get one strand acting as a template for another strand. Uh, and again, the one strand acts as a template for the other strand. Uh, whereas in dispersive, you get a chunk of DNA and then a copy of a chunk and a chunk of DNA and a copy chunk. So uh, the semi conservative model is the one where we have evidence for actually this occurring. Yeah, in other words, you've got a strand which forms a template for another strand to form on and another strand which forms a strand for the template for the other strand. Now, uh, the work for this is quite elegant. It's a good scientific research uh, element. And it was done by two scientists called Meselson and Starr. They were ones who showed that um, they have DNA replicates semi-conservatively. So to do this, you need to grow E. coli, Escherichia coli, which are a type of bacteria. Uh, and you put them in a, sort of a growth medium, a nutrient broth, so that they will take up something called heavy uh, nitrogen. Remember that nitrogen, when you look at it on the periodic table, 
uh, its mass number is 14 and you can have different isotopes which have a slightly different number of neutrons in this case it has an extra neutron so it makes it nitrogen 50 so it's not the stuff that's normally uh, present if you leave it with uh, with the nitrogen 15 isotope it eventually takes up that nitrogen and it ends up being incorporated into the DNA and you want to make sure that at least one set of your bacteria have all of that particular type of nitrogen in their DNA then you can save it for later and use it in your experiment. So let's fill up the test tube, take a bit of that, drop it in there, and you take some more uh, of a different strand. I'm assuming it's going to uh, transfer a sample from there. Uh, it says into a medium into there. So uh, there we go, back into that one. That's what I was looking for. Uh, the E. coli, you take it in and you, know, you need to leave it for a, about a one cell cycle's worth. So in other words, enough time for the DNA to have divided once and only once. That takes about 50 minutes for the E. coli. So take a sample of your substance, pop it in the test tube, and leave it time for another set of uh, division to have taken place. Uh, rinse and repeat. So let's just skip to there so that we can do that. Suck it up drop it in and so on uh, so you've now got three samples you add it to cesium chloride and that stops it from dividing any further take a set of DNA a sample of DNA from um, each one and you've now got comparisons you've got the just the with the heavy isotope with your first generation your second generation and the um, sort of control experiment if you like what it would look like without and then you spin them in a centrifuge. Remember, a centrifuge is a device that, here we go, shows you here, uh, has the uh, possibility to put the test tubes in. Uh, they need to be balanced on either side. So you have four tubes, one in each corner. Get them to spin round uh, so that the substances settle out. And you can actually look at then where you, the uh, sort of different materials are. Because if you've got different amounts of nitrogen, they're going to be he some are going to be heavier than others. So if you click on that one, it's got a band that forms slightly deeper down because it's heavier. So all of your DNA strand, both strands, contain heavy nitrogen. This one um, has heavy strand and a light strand. In other words, it has one strand that is uh, was from the original parent and one new strand. So this first generation has an intermediate band. It is neither all heavy or all light yeah, if we look at that one that's all light so it's kind of uh, much higher up dna so you can see the control between all heavy nitrogen and all light nitrogen and that one uh, again has a bit of a mix it has some strands which are the same as the first generation and some which are all light so it's kind of showing you quite elegantly that as DNA replicates, you've gone from uh, all heavy, mix of heavy and light, your next strand uh, is either heavy and light or all light and all light. So in other words, the strands are being passed from one generation to the next and they're used as a copy. So it's showing you how the semi-conservative copying is taking place. Only one strand from, from each strand is used to form a template for the next, and form a template for the next, and form a template for the next as each um, generation divides and so on. Now, how does it generate? Um, it's all uh, about enzymes doing some separating. So there, motoring away very quickly, was this enzyme called helicase. Um, it moves along the DNA strands and breaks the bonds. Uh, so it's breaking these hydrogen bonds between one strand and the next. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about replication forks or uh, these proteins you do need to be aware of the fact that the uh, replication takes place and it's run by enzymes um, then you need a new strand to form on this one so this one's acting as a template you've got another enzyme moving along this template and in fact reading it it's saying right well if this base is there then the opposite base needs to be put on so if it's uh, T with one, it needs to be A with the other. If it's G with one, it needs to be C with the other. So by knowing which base is already there, it knows which base to put in next.
Yeah, so the DNA polymerase will work its way up. Uh, and it works from 3 prime to 5 prime end, uh, working its way along. And on the other strand, uh, you've got it going down the opposite direction because the strands run in the opposite direction. Um, it, it, on this strand, it does it continuously, it just reads all the way up. In this uh, strand, it tends to do it in sections. These are called Okazaki fragments. So it does a bit and then joins another bit, and it needs to join those bits together with another enzyme called a ligase. So once you've got the four fragments, it joins the fragments together. Um, and as this helicase moves along, the bit behind it sort of continues to form uh, new strands. Uh, let's just look at that. I think it's a macro scale here. Yeah, so that you can see that we're forming sort of replication bubbles. So there can be lots of sections can be copied at once. Yeah, so it doesn't need to be all uh, being done sort of one bit at a time. It can be done repeatedly on different pieces. Yeah, till you get a whole two new strands. Yeah, again, one from the original parent and one copy. One from the original parent and a copy. Yeah, that's semi-conservative replication. One strand is retained or conserved, and then the other one is not. It, so it's only one strand is conserved, hence the semi-conservative method. Yeah, one strand's retained, the next is not. Uh, as another YouTube reference, have a go at that. Uh, you're welcome to watch other people talking as well as me. Uh, other people can maybe do it better, and they've got much better animation sometimes. Um, you might want to think about how you can describe semi-conservative replication at the end of this as well. Uh, and we'll do these activities in class. Okay, uh, thank you for listening. Enjoy semi-conservative replication. Uh, you need to know uh, what it is. You need to have a brief idea of the names of all these enzymes. Um, the bits about the fragments, I don't know whether that's going to come up or not. Uh, but certainly make sure you know what semi-conservative replication is. Uh, and we'll carry out these activities in class. Okay, thanks for listening. Speak to you next time.